Thank you for joining Wars of the Roses. As we continue with part 35, the Book of Purifying Fire, Book 6, The Written Word of Kabbalism, third period from the Doctrine and Literature of the Kabbalah by Arthur Edward Waite. 2. The Book of Purifying Fire. When a given order of mystic symbolism, possessing distinct objects and a sphere of application more or less defined, is applied to the purposes of another order, we may expect to derive some curious results from the analogy thus instituted if we can get to understand the method, though, as I have already indicated, this superincession of typology is usually somewhat dazing in its results. The treatise entitled Aesh Metzaref, which signifies purifying fire, is an instance of the application of Kabbalistic apparatus to the purposes of alchemy, and is, so far as I'm aware, the sole instance of its kind. In this connection, we shall, however, do well to remember that hermetic and Kabbalistic philosophy are ascribed by the majority of authorities in occultism to a common source, while the rabbicinical influence in alchemy is well illustrated by such legends as that of Rabbi Abraham and Flamel. It is true that a work under the title of the Philosophical Stone is attributed to Sadia by Moses Batrel, but we know it only by a single quotation, and we are not in a position to say whether or not it is concerned with metallic transmutation. A few alchemical allusions are to be found in the Zohar, which recognizes the existence of an archetypal gold, and regards the metals generally as composite substances. But these references are almost less than incidental, and it is needless to say that there is no occult chemistry, seriously speaking, in the great theosophical storehouse. The treatise on purifying fire is written in Aramaic Chaldee, which is the language of the Talmud and the Zohar. It was made use of so largely by Rosenroth in his lexicon that practically the whole work is found rendered into Latin in the pages of the Kabbalah Denudata. It was reconstructed from this source in the early part of the 18th century by an occultist, styling himself a lover of philalethes, and was by him put into an English vesture. In the year 1894, this translation was included in a series of hermetic reprints under the editorship of Dr. Wynne Westcott. The preface and notes which accompany this edition appear under the pseudonym of Sapere Aud and are of considerable value. No information is, however, given as to the Chaldee original, and the gaps occurring in the reconstruction have not been filled. There is no evidence available by which we can fix, with any degree of precision, the period at which this treatise was composed. It is subsequent, of course, to the promulgation of the Zohar, which it quotes frequently. It is subsequent to the Garden of Pomegranates by R. Moses of Cordova, a treatise possibly belonging to the middle of the 16th century, which it also quotes. It borrows processes from R. Mordecai, a Kabbalistic alchemist whose date I have failed to discover, and it refers to the forged Latin treatises of Geber. We may therefore conclude that it does not antedate Rosenroth by any considerable period and may be placed conjecturally at the beginning of the 17th century. Finally, it contains expressions which are common to most of the Latin alchemists and were by them derived from the Greeks, such as he that is wise may correct natures. It does not therefore possess the interest or importance which would attach to a chemico kabbalistic treatise of the Zohar period, and I have not been able to find any evidence as to the authority ascribed to it. In the supplement to his Key of the Great Mysteries, Eliphas Levi gives, firstly, what he terms the fragments of the Aish Metzaref, terming it one of the most important books of hermetic science. Secondly, the complements of its eight chapters being further fragments which he claims to have discovered. Thirdly, the hypothetical restitution of the original, the methods of the brilliant French occultist are well illustrated in each case. It should be observed that the fragments are designed to exhibit the difficulties and the weariness which his researches have spared to his readers, and to illustrate the conscientious and serious nature of his studies. The first section proves, when examined, not to be the fragments of the Ish Metzaref, but a loose paraphrase which has a very slender correspondence with the original. The second section, which is similarly paraphrased, is substantially to be found in Rosenroth and the English version. The hypothetical reconstruction serves only to show that Levi, like everyone else, never saw the original, which some have said is still extant, or he would not have so misplaced his ingenuity. Lastly, he attributes the work to Rabbi Abraham of the Flamel legend, 
thus investing it with an antiquity which is contradicted by its own references. Before indicating, however, briefly the heads of its contents, it is necessary to observe that the Aesh Metzaref must be for the ordinary student only a curious memorial of the connections instituted between two orders of mystic symbolism. It is described by its latest editor as suggestive rather than explanatory, and he adds that its alchemical processes are not set out in such a way that they could be carried out by a neophyte. Any attempt to do so would discover that something vital was missing at one stage or other. The statement is true of all alchemical literature, and the Aish Metzarif has the common difficulties of purely hermetic books, further complicated by the system of gematria and the sephirotic correspondences of the metals. On the correspondences here indicated, the treatise is mainly based, and it is in this sense that the mysteries of alchemical transmutation are said to differ not from the superior mysteries of the Kabbalah. The sephiroth of the material world are identical with those of the archetypal, and they are the same in the mineral kingdom. The alchemical root of the metals corresponds to kether. All metals originate therefrom, as the other sephiroth are all emanations from the crown. The crown is concealed, so also is the metallic root. Lead is referred to chokma, which proceeds immediately from kether as Saturn from the metallic root. Tin has the place of bina, silver that of chesed, and these three are the white metallic natures. Among the red, gold is in correspondence with Gebera. Iron with Tifereth and the hermaphroditic brass with Netzach and Hod. Quicksilver is referred to Jesud and the true medicine of metals, to Malkuth. The attribution will appear in some cases a little conventional, and it depends upon a curious use of scriptural authority. However, the writer adds, If anyone hath placed these things in another order, I shall not contend with him inasmuch as all systems tend to the one truth. In illustration of this, he gives another attribution as follows. The three supernals, namely Kether, Chokma, and Bina, are the three fountains of metallic things. The thick water, that is mercury, is Kether, salt is Chokma, and sulfur is Bina. These are the three principles of the alchemists. This attribution, says the treatise, is for known reasons. Chest, Geborah, and Tifereth correspond as before to silver, gold, and iron. Netzach is tin, Hod is copper, Jesod is lead, while Malkuth is the metallic woman, the lunar of the wise, and the field into which the seeds of secret minerals ought to be cast, that is, the water of gold. The attribution in either case has a concealed sense which no tongue may be permitted to utter. The superficial explanations offered here and there should not therefore be taken seriously, as for example that silver is referred to chest on account of its whiteness which denotes mercy and pity. The Kamiya or magical squares of the planets are given in connection with each of the seven metals, but not always correctly. The peculiar genius of the work is well illustrated in the third chapter, where Daniel's vision of the beast with ten horns is interpreted alchemically by the help of Gematria. Thank you for watching and please don't forget to share, like, subscribe and comment. And if you can, please consider donating to Wars of the Roses. Links to PayPal and Patreon are in the description. Thank you so very much.